Okay, welcome to the Action Coach Business Extra podcast. My guest today is the best-selling author of Built to Sell and The Automatic Customer, with a third book on the way, I believe. He's a fellow podcaster. He's the host of Built to Sell Radio, which Forbes magazine ranked in the top 10 of podcasts for business owners, and is a serial entrepreneur, having started and exited four companies before founding the Value Builder System. Welcome to Mr. John Warrillow. Welcome, John. Thanks, Paul. Good to be with you. Great to see you. We're going to talk more about Value Builder and how people can build value into their companies in a little while. But I just wanted to start by asking you, John, how you got started. Well, I've been, yeah, I've been involved in a couple of businesses. My last one, I had to make a fairly big shift to making it less dependent on me. And I wrote about that in Built to Sell. And I speak about you know, building to sell quite a bit these days, not so much, but in the past quite a bit. And when I would get conversations going about sort of how do I drive and improve my value, I realized there was really a need for helping people focus on what makes their business more valuable, not just bigger. A lot of people are focused on on kind of scaling their, their business as large as they possibly can, but oftentimes that comes at the expense of value. And really, it was through some of those conversations that we started to f- come up with the idea for Value Builder, which is a new company where we help entrepreneurs uh, through coaches like yourself uh, improve the value of their company leading up to an exit. Best-selling author of Built to Sell, which Mm. was led on to the the podcast as well. Is it 200? How many podcasts have you done now, John? You just celebrated a big anniversary. Yeah, thank you for acknowledging that. 250, yeah, quarter quarter, quarter thousand, if you will, 250K. So we interview a different entrepreneur every week of the year. And my focus is on the very last stage of their business life cycle. So it's really on the the selling of the company. So what, Uh you know, what made you think about selling? What were the mechanics around it? What were the biggest mistakes you make and so forth? So that's, that's built to sell radio. Yeah. And uh, obviously the value builder system as well, that we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail as a a value builder practitioner myself as well. We run regular workshops around building value into companies. And there are three elements, obviously, to to um, starting, running, and, and selling a company. Obviously, you need to build it, you hopefully accelerate the growth of that company, and then harvest it as as best you can. And and we'll talk about all those three elements um, over the next half hour or so, John. Right. So, if we talk about value builder, obviously, you've talked about the reasons why you started Value Builder, and that's to help as many business owners as you can. As a business coach, that's my job as well Mm -hmm. to help build value into companies for business owners so they can have the life that they dreamed of when they first went into business, but often get stuck on the hamster wheel of business. Um, Or as you've called it um, often, the, the, the owner's trap, if you will, in business. Mm. Um, Do you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of the owner's trap? Yeah. I mean, Michael Gerber was the guy who first coined the term, the entrepreneurial seizure. If you've read the E-Myth, you know that a lot of people have that uh, idea where they have a, a concept, they're a, an industry expert in what they do, and they think, why should I work for this bloke? Why don't I go and start my business? And so they they go and start a business. And, and it goes pretty well, but because they have lots of industry expertise, it means that customers often ask them to go much beyond what their original conception was for a business idea. And as, as they get further and further away from their business idea, the business becomes more and more dependent on them personally, because they're the mm. only ones who can deliver the job. And so the company traditionally will, will, will plateau. Uh, maybe it's 300 pounds and uh, 300,000 pounds in revenue or 500,000 pounds in revenue, uh, but it plateaus. And so that's when uh, the owner needs to sort of pull him or herself out of the business and get it to run without, without them. And yeah. that's the, you know, that's the, the essence of a built to sell company. It's one that can thrive without the owner Interestingly, it doesn't have to be that you want to sell it. It can be no. that you want to get your life back, right? And and that's the essence of, it's the very same things that make a business fun to own are the same things that acquirers look for when they go buy a business. So whether you want yeah. to sell or just hold it in perpetuity, it's good to yeah. focus on you know, what acquirers care about. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's about that freedom. You know, we're, we, we the, the next workshop we're running is the freedom workshop and, and it's Fantastic. about business owners having that freedom to choose what they do. You know, I, I come across business owners all the time who really love getting on the tools still, but it gives them the choice of what they do and when they do it. Um, and, and that's the important thing. You know, many business yeah, A lot owners- of people, I, I'd be interested in, in your perspective on this, Paul. What, what I'm he- seeing over here in North America is a lot of business owners have 
have gone back into their business uh, in a much more in the weeds of it than they ever mm. want to. They, they, have, they have laid off some staff, uh, other staff have gotten sick, other staff have, are caring for people who've gotten sick during COVID. And as a result, the owners are, have gone from having this wonderful lifestyle where they're kind of checking in on their business a few hours a, a, you know, a week to doing all the things they haven't done for years and years and years. And so right now is, is a great time to pull up and as, as we start to reopen the economy is to say, hold, hang on a minute. Um, you, you don't want to be at the epicenter of your company. You've got to put the structures mm. and systems in place that allow you to pull yourself out and, uh, and, and for your business to continue to run without you. So it's been a good reminder, I think, of the last couple of months that, that um, we've still got work to do in helping owners structure their company so that they can run without them. Yeah, yeah, it's been exactly the same here in the UK, John. We've had um, we've had a no- number of business owners who furloughed all the staff, and they're either either the only person or one of one or two people still left working in the company. They're getting back on the tools. They're going out and doing the jobs themselves and keeping their. How employees. do we send an invoice again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> how do I turn the computer on even? Yeah. Um, but it's such an ideal time now to be looking at your company and planning for the future. I think as I I agree, yeah. As I as agree. you said in one of the um, one of the presentations that you did, you know, if you had a if you had a house that got um, that comp- got demolished in a in a storm, would you rebuild it exactly the same way? And now is the ideal time to think about your business, don't you think? I agree a hundred percent because you know when business is good and thriving thriving on 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 all cylinders, so to speak, um, we make these little decisions that have the have an un, a, unfortunate sort of ramification where they stack one on top of the other and they, they get a momentum and inertia of themselves. So maybe we start selling a product or service that's a little outside of our sweet spot, but you know, it's revenue and a customer asks for. It. And so we, we maybe hire someone who's not quite a cultural fit, but they're okay. And, and, you know, now that they're working and we train them, why bother getting rid of them? Well, all that's been thrown out the window, right? So yeah, all of yeah. that is, it's an opportunity to re-examine everything. The culture you're kind of trying to build, the value. And, and value is important, I think, in this context because when an acquirer looks at a business, whether you want to sell in 10 years, 50 years down the road, when an acquirer looks at a business, they're going to look at your products and services and they are going to pay a premium for things they cannot do easily And they are going to deeply discount the products and services that you sell, which are commoditized, are me too products. And and for many of us, we have lots of those products, right? Yeah. And they suck up cash and they suck up mental energy. And even though they're helping us improve our top line turnover, they may not be actually contributing much to the value of our company. If we redeploy those resources to more valuable uh, products and services, I, I, I it, it can mean a, a much more uh, valuable exit down the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's why value builder, um, the value builder system is so great because a lot of business owners, the, the problem is they don't know where to start. They know they need to do something. They know they're stuck working in the business. They know they need to redesign it, but they don't know where to start. And I think the value builder system gives them a great framework of of different areas of focus in the business. Where they can where they can start working on building value into the business, and as you say, it doesn't necessarily need to be because they want to sell. You know, there's a whole host of different reasons for building the the, the value of the asset in the business. Um, let, let's have a look at those eight key drivers, um, sure. John. Obviously, the first and most obvious one is is financial performance, but it's not just about the numbers, is it? No, it's not. I mean, financial performance, I get a question a lot. Uh, should I focus on my top line turnover or bottom line profit? The cheeky answer is both. Yeah. Uh, neither is necessarily more important, uh, but both are important. There's a rule of 40, which a lot of acquirers look at, in particular in the technology world, where your EBITDA multiple, your earnings before interest tax depreciation, and your growth rate on a percentage terms add up to 40. And if they add up to 40, so 30% profit and 10% growth, or 20% and 20%, uh, that's, a very, that's a very valuable company, in particular in mm. the technology context. So that rule of 40 is something 
something to, to, to chase and to think about it. It makes, it makes you have to focus on both top line and bottom line. And that can be intre- incredibly valuable. The other piece of it is the efficacy or the quality of your bookkeeping. And this is <laughs> often uh, something that a lot of owners overlook, right? Because the, you know, uh, no one wants to be doing bookkeeping or accounting and, no. but it's important. And, and acquirers get very nervous when they can't trust the books. And so starting now, whether you want to sell in 20 years or 10 years or five years, starting now, I think is a really important uh, process. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so easy now with the advent of the, the cloud-based accounting software that we've got sure. all the different packages. It's so easy. Are but you guys on Xero or, in, or QuickBooks or what's Yeah, we've, we've got Xero, QuickBooks, Sage. Um, there's another one called Free Agent. Xero's, I think, is the biggest in the UK just at the moment. I but so, it yeah. still surprises me. I've still walked into potential clients <laughs> uh, and started talking to them about their bookkeeping. And there's a bag comes out with uh, full of invoices from the last <laughs> right. month. And they're saying, I must yeah. go through these sometimes. So, you know, it doesn't exactly add value to what they're looking at. I can just imagine the look no. that an acquirer would give it when they walk through the door. Yeah. Um, the financial performance is the first one. And the next one is obviously the growth potential of the company um, yeah. and, and the size of the industry and the size of the market that they're working in. You bet. So really it comes down to when an acquirer buys a business, they're looking at what is the future? And most entrepreneurs, we want to be, be sort of judged on the past, how much revenue we you know, generated in the past or how much profit we made. But acquirers are thinking about the future. If we buy this business, what is it that we could do with it? I just did a podcast with the guy who started Dreamwater. Do you know Dreamwater? No, I don't know. Have you ever seen five five hour energy bottles? These little five yes. millimeter bottles. You get them at the gas station and stuff like yep. that. He did the opposite. He created Dream Water, which are five milliliter bottles, like shots of water that helps you relax in the evening. And and so when he looked at the growth potential of this business, any consumer packaged goods company with distribution could slot that product into their distribution and almost overnight uh, you know, catapult it for grow it exponentially because he had one product and relatively limited distribution through pharmacies and, and uh, some supermarkets. But you know, a consumer packaged goods like a Unilever uh, could acquire that. It turned out, ironically, uh, the b- highest bidder was a cannabis company. Uh, they pulled. They, they, they paid thirty four point five million U S dollars for a business turning over ten million dollars in wow. revenue. So a very very premium multiple. But he had multiple bidders, and it was a it was a, it was a big, huge success story. So it just goes to show you the growth potential. What your company will do in the future is so very important when it comes to uh, the value of your. Company. Yeah. And I think one of the things that business owners don't do is actually investigate the market enough to understand what actually is the market value. What's the total market value of their particular products and service in, in the UK market for us here? And what other services or what other products could they add to that to, to increase you know the market that they're aiming at? Not only increase, but also differentiate. Again, if you're selling a commodity, if you're selling lawn care services, painting services, uh, sand that people put in their, you know, in their in their garden or whatever, if you can compare on an apples to apples basis that product or service with another, it's very difficult to get an acquirer interested in buying that company because mm. they'll just say most acquire acquisitions are done by companies at least five times the size of the target, and so they're going to look at that business and say, well, we're selling sand. Well, if we just drop our price by 5%, we'll pick up all of his business or all of her business, right? Or we're selling lawn care. So what you want to do is not only, I think, think about what product or service can you grow, but how can you create a defendable market position, something that makes you truly unique in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm foreshadowing one of the other drivers, but that's really <laughs> important in when it comes to your growth potential, focusing in on the one thing that makes you unique or special. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next one um, always makes me smile because of the name of it, the Switzerland structure, named after one of our European neighbors, of course, who, who remain fiercely independent. And it's all about how um, reliant a, a business is on one particular supplier, one particular customer, or one particular employee. Yeah, you guys think you're focused on on independence with with, with 
<laughs> with Brexit, you should see the uh, the Swiss. I mean, the, you know, the history is unbelievable. They didn't join either of the world wars. You know, I mean, they didn't. They don't join. They, you know, use the euro uh, and so forth. So yeah, they had this obsession with independence, and so it's really making sure your company is not dependent on a single customer, employee, or supplier. And, and again, what's what's unique is not that you want to sell your company, but what that does is give you diversity among your risk, right? So if you're too mm. reliant on a single supplier, the problem is that sometimes that supplier can change strategy. I, I know a, a telecom company, they install phone systems in small businesses. Yeah. And do you have a, you have a Via in, in the UK? Yes, we do. Brand yeah. people? Yeah. So, so he got to a point where 93% of his supply was coming from Avaya. Very naturally, they were giving him better terms, longer terms to pay, better margins and so forth. And and when he went to sell a $26 million business, nobody was interested. And when they asked kind of why, they all said, well, you're too dependent on Avaya, right? 93% of your supply. If Avaya yeah. changes strategy, they go direct, they decide not to use resellers, they go bankrupt, they change their terms, you're out of business. And so even though you may have to give up a point or two of margin, making sure that you are de- independent of any one customer, employee, or supplier, I think is a, is a big, big driver of value. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Particularly at the moment with the situation around um, the, the the uncertainty of the economy. Yeah. You know, if you're reliant on one supplier and, and, and they go under because of the pandemic, then where does that leave you and the value of your business? So really relevant right now, I think. I'll, I'll give you another example, Paul. We just I just did an interview uh, for Built to Sell Radio with a woman. Here, here's the thing. The problem with having a, a, an over-dependence on a single customer in particular or a single employee or even a supplier is, is that you may be able to sell your business, but you'll ultimately have to have to commit to an earnout. And yeah. an earnout is where the, the risk is really put back on your shoulders, where you are asked to, 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 to hit a set of goals in the future. I just did an interview with this woman. She started this little salad company in Oregon, making salads. She built one successful location. She went and got investors to invest and in fact, one of her advisors was an investor, which is which was a problem. She got money on a two and a half x, what's called a liquidity preference, meaning that the, yep. when the buyer comes in, the investors get two and a half x their money before she yep. gets anything. She went to sell the business, and uh, she was only get, able to get an offer that essentially wiped her out of any value. And the only value she got was an earnout, meaning okay. the future profits of her business. That was in October of 2019. Uh, in March 2020, Oregon, all restaurants were shut yeah. down and her earnout became zero. Even though she'd built this amazing business, she didn't actually pull out any money uh, wow. because of an earnout. And again, the Switzerland structure is is usually the way acquirers will deal with a company that is too dependent on a single supplier or customer. Yeah. Uh, they'll give you an earnout. She must have had a few choice words, I think, at the time. I think so. I think so. Yeah. So, so the next key driver, and I've got to take you to task about this, John. The valuation teeter totter. Where on earth? <laughs> seesaw, Paul. Seesaw. Yes, seesaw. <laughs> please. So, tell us more about the valuation seesaw, John. Sure. So, if you think about a child's playground, uh, and you think the heavy kid gets on, the light kid goes up on the seesaw. Same thing is true when it comes to the value of your business. Meaning, the more cash your company accumulates. The, the 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 less the acquirer needs to invest in yep. working capital and therefore the more they are willing to pay for your business because when an acquirer goes and buys your business effectively they are writing two checks right they they write a check to you the owner but yep. they also write a check to your company for working capital and so the bigger the check they have to write for working capital because you've got a negative cash flow cycle for example um, the smaller the check they are willing to write to you. Yeah. In inverse, of course, if, if they don't have to write a check to you for working capital, then they're willing to write a bigger check. And again, this, this doesn't have to be about wanting to sell your business imminently, but once you get your positive cash flow cycle in place, it allows you to grow without diluting yourself, right? You don't have to yeah. take on investors. You can really grow. You can sleep at night. And, um, and so that's going to be an important element of building the value of your company, making sure and, and again, to draw the distinction, cash is actually money coming into the bank, uh-huh. whereas profit and loss is, is what we talked about. Financial performance is an expression, you know, basically uh-huh. done by accountants. Yeah. 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 And, and again, you know, I speak to business owners now who really don't understand 
the numbers. So important. You know, there's been some surveys done about uh, business failures in the UK. And I think in the first five years, 80% of SME startups fail. And, and the number one reason is for business owners not understanding the numbers during that time. Yeah. So, so, so important. Um, the, the next one, I think, you know, if you to ask any startup company, any any young entrepreneur um, about recurring revenue, that that would be the one that they understand helps them to build value and accelerate the growth of the company. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you've got a great ebook that we're going to make available to people if they want to sign up afterwards oh, um, about those um, nine subscription models. Um, so we're not going to go through them all, but maybe we can touch on one or two of those um, just to help people understand what we mean by recurring revenues for the business. Yeah. I mean, young people, you know, running a SaaS company, software as a service company, no recurring revenue all day long, but oftentimes businesses who've been around a while look at recurring revenue and think, well, that's just not the way it works in my industry. Maybe they distribute a plumbing part or they have a, a, a retail shop or they have a manufacturing business and they're like, oh, you know, that's nice for software companies, but you know, we sell a thing. And I always tell them about the story of H. Bloom. H. Bloom is in the business of selling flowers. They were, think about uh-huh. it, a, high, a high street flower shop. And high street flower shops have a problem because they got to pay rent it's a big problem right now. They've also got uh, inventory, which dies the moment the farmer cuts it off the, the, the vine. Typical flower shop, high street flower shop will throw out 60% of its inventory every month wow. because they buy wrong. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so they've got to stimulate demand. How do they do that? Well, they, again, get very expensive high street space. And so it's a really broken business model. These guys, Son Yu Panda and Brian Burkout cart came along and said, how do we reinvent this business? And what they built was H. Bloom, a subscription-based flower company. And you might say, well, who on earth buys flowers on subscription other than you know, people who are going through a divorce and they're trying to woo back their, you know, their, their, their mate with, with monthly subscription. But actually, that's not the target. They, target, they focused on high-end hotels, restaurants, spas, wealth management companies who want to give sort of that very prestigious image. And they said, we'll sell you a subscription to flowers. We'll come, we'll get rid of the old ones. We'll send you a commercial grade invoice because you're a business, not a consumer. And it became a a, a huge success in an Mm. industry High shop, you know, high street retail, which is not usually one indicative of recurring revenue. So I think you know, you mentioned, and you're making great that you're making available to your uh, colleagues the nine subscription models. But there are nine, and I think virtually every company, again, whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer, distributor, service company, can create some recurring revenue, and that just makes your business so much more predictable. And again, you may say, I don't want to sell, uh, but remember the predictability of a business is so precious because when you're sitting here saying how many how many trucks or vans or lorries am mm-hmm. I going to need on the road in six months? How many technicians am I going to need next year? You're guessing if you're yeah. working on a transaction business model. Whereas if you've got subscriptions and subscribers and you're checking how, how readily they recur, uh, it's, uh, it's much easier to predict your business. Yeah, yeah, we're talking to two of our clients right now about how they can introduce um, recurring revenue models into their business. One of them is a, um, is a beauty salon. And one of them is a, a hairdressers. So they're, they're both looking at how they can introduce a subscription model into their business, a recurring revenue stream into their business by, produ- by producing a, a sort of bronze, silver, gold level Correct. offer for all of their clients. Um, and they can just pay on a monthly fee regardless of what they have each month. There's a, there's a great, there's a subscription based uh, hairdresser guys, uh, haircuts in, um, I believe they're in, in uh, Seattle, Washington. Here's what they did, because here's the thing with subscription. If somebody comes in once a month for a haircut and they pay whatever it is, $25, 25 pounds, um, you could say, okay, well, we'll put it on subscription. It'll be 12 times a year and it's 12 times 25, uh, 300 pounds. Nobody's going to take that deal, right? Because people would rather the 300 pounds in their pocket than giving it to you in advance, right? So there's got to be some really serious benefit for them. What they did was they said, look guys, we're going to, we're going to give our club members, the people who subscribe the best time spots. So there's, they know when people want to get a haircut. So they get preferential uh, demand. They also get 
the neck shave whenever they want to come in. So as guys, I, you know, like I need a haircut right now, as you can God, see. Yeah, but, me too. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but most of us get their haircut once every whatever, four or five weeks. But the, we get the kind of the, the mess, the back of our neck yeah. every two or three weeks. Well, they're, you know, so for their club members, their subscribers, they come in anytime and we won't charge you. And so for guys to get their haircut once every five weeks, it's a nice thing to be able to pop in 10 minutes, have a shave, the back of the neck. That's just one of the little tiny things they've done to make it special for their subscribers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think building that extra value in for, for your clients is so, so important. Something that we talk to about our, our, our clients, about their customers all the time. Um, the, the next uh, one we've already touched on, which is monopoly control, about differentiating your business. And again, that, that can be around the services that you offer and, and, and really differentiating and adding value and making yourself unique in the marketplace. And the next one, it, it, it again reflects what we were just talking about in terms of customer satisfaction. You know, how do you get your clients to to repurchase from you and also refer you? How do you turn them into raving fans of your business so they're going to become your salespeople and start referring you to others? And that can obviously add add huge amounts of value to a business. It can, but it's tricky because most business owners offer an amazing experience to their customers. And if they ever say, you know, if you ask a business owner, hey, why do customers choose you over your competitors? They'll say, oh, we offer great customer service. The question though becomes, are they buying you personally because they know that you are going to oversee the delivery of that mm -hmm. service or product or your company? And in most cases, they know that it's because the owner is going to oversee their job that they are going to get great service. And so what we have to do is go from the owner offering great customer service to institutionalizing great customer yeah. service across the company. And the best way that, that we know of how to do that is through Net Promoter Score. And this is the quick survey you ask your customer, scale of zero to 10, how likely they are to recommend this to a friend or colleague. And it turns out that question is highly predictive that the company will grow in the future. And mm. so that can be a great way if you're an owner and you want to say, what is it that we can do to make sure we have raving fans as customers using the net promoter score questionnaire can be a great way to, to tease out or separate. Do they love me as the owner or is it yeah. my company? And that's a really important distinction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that takes us on to the last driver of as well, which is hub and spoke and, and just how reliant is your company on you? And I know one of the questions in the value builder score questionnaire um, that we're also going to make available to anybody who who um, has actually listened to this and wants oh, to get fantastic. more information um, is around how well they know each of their customers personally. And, you know, every business owner that I speak to is really proud when they tell me that they are on first name terms with every single one of their customers and um, are surprised sometimes to learn that that's going to decrease and not increase the value of the company. Absolutely. It, it, it makes common sense, right? Because when you think about it from an acquirer's point of view, they're going to buy this company, they're going to write you a big check, and then you're going to ride off into the sunset and they're going to be left holding the bag. And if you hold all the relationships that people value you personally and know you personally, there's nothing there that, that they haven't bought much in essence. Yeah. Their, their business is going to crush or, or uh, uh, go down as you leave. And so what they want to ensure is that the relationships, first of all, there aren't uh, a lot of customer concentration issues, which we measure through Switzerland structure. Second of all, the relationships don't rely on you personally being there. And so, you know, that comes down to making sure that you're not at the epicenter. Uh, and, and we're coming up to high season for holiday time. I know you can't travel that much, but but for those of you who can travel a little bit, it, it can be a great opportunity to see how well your company does perform yeah. without you. You take a couple of days off and see uh, what breaks down. Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it, is it product delivery? Is it operations? And that's where you know you need to bolster your, uh, your systems. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we often set a challenge. We, you know, we'll go to a lot of uh, networking meetings, do short presentations. One of our challenges is always, can you take five or six weeks out of your business? Don't take your telephone with you. Don't take your laptop with you. Um, what kind of state is your company going to be in when you get back? Is it still going to be growing? Is it still going to be making profit, acquiring new customers, satisfying everybody that they've already got? Um, and the answer to that in the vast majority of cases is, is no, it isn't. 
and it sends a shiver down the spine at the thought of having to do that. So it's a great starting point to understand, you know, the areas of your business that you need to look at. So that's that's the eight key drivers. Um, now, the Value Builder Score uh, questionnaire is a great tool as a starting point for anybody who wants to delve deeper into those eight key drivers. Can you just tell us a little bit more about how that works, John? Yeah, it's essentially an acquirer's view of your business. And you're going to say, well, I don't want to sell my company. That's fine. What you can do by getting the value builder score is see how an external person, an investor, an acquirer would view your company. So whether you want to sell in five years or 25 years, you can start to look at the decisions you're making through the lens of an acquirer. And I think the questions like, how well do you know your customers, as an example, uh, may be actually educational in and of itself. What we hear from a lot of owners is say, wow, it helped me think about my business differently in a way that I'd never thought about business before. I've kind of grown up in business and thinking about revenue and profit and, and cash flow, but I've never really thought about the, the nuances of value. So I think it can be uh, an educational experience in and of itself. And then mm. when you and your team, Paul, go and kind of share with owners their results, I think they're really going to see um, some major improvements and, and, and some ways to very quickly add tremendous value to their company. Yeah, and we've done that multiple times now with with people who've who've completed the value builder score questionnaire. It only takes sort of 13, 14, 15 minutes to complete. It's a very short questionnaire to complete. Um, but when you show them the report and the and the content and the and the areas that they can work on in the business, and then give them access to to the rest of the value builder system to help them with that and coach them through that, it can make an amazing amount of difference to the business. And we've seen the the benefits of that with our clients already. Um, it's amazing. So we're going to put the link for that um, in the description on the bottom of the podcast. So anybody who wants to take advantage of that, do a quick 13 minute questionnaire, get the results from that. It'll give you a great starting point for your business. So that's value builder, but it's not just about building value into the company. It's about what you do when you do decide that perhaps you're coming up to the stage where you want to consider what to do next. And obviously there's, there's the, the growth and building parts. There's the acceleration through through making sure that the eight key drivers are, are, are working for you. And then there's the third element, which you call harvesting. And, and there's a, a three elements to that, isn't there, John, in terms of, of things to consider before you start, um, building it, your, your negotiating leverage, if you will, and, and, and really whether you can punch above your weight when it comes to getting the right multiple of, of, of profit for your business. That's exactly right. And, and yeah, that's uh, that's a book that I've written called The Art of Selling Your Business coming out in January of, of next year. And it's exactly as you describe. It's how do you punch above your weight when you sell your company? And, and there's a lot of people that will try to take advantage of you when you sell your company. There are private equity companies out there that will try to get your company for pennies on the dollar. There are large companies that try to pick up small businesses, in particular in stressed and, and distressed times. Um, and so this is really your antidote. This is the the way to fight back in those in those conditions is to is to build a narrative. And you know anybody can sell a business for an industry standard multiple, but really the the magic, the dream water at selling a ten million dollar business for thirty four and a half million dollars. The magic is in the the nuance. It's in the story that you tell, the narrative that you uh, that you that you that you weave along the way, and that's. Uh, that's an important element. And um, most of us only have one shot at, at a successful exit to fund your retirement. And so it's important yeah. to get it right. Worth, worth spending some time thinking about it. Yeah, th- there was one particular story. Um, and I can't remember the name of the company or the lady. And you will, I'm sure. Um, I'm putting you on the spot now. Um, it was a lady who, who started an accounting um, system service for, for people who were employing nannies. In the oh States. yeah, Stephanie Breedlove. Yeah, Stephanie Breedlove. Yeah, how can you forget yeah. a name like that? So yeah. tell, tell us, tell yeah. us that story. Yeah, briefly. So she she built a uh, a payroll company that pays uh, nan parents who have nannies and au pair. They they would pay them and beautiful little business, nine million dollars in revenue, and and you think, oh, okay, maybe she she got one times you know, turnover. So, so $9 million would be a classic sort of uh, revenue multiple of a, of a service-based business. She sold it for $54 million, fully six times top line revenue. I mean, it's just, it's just an incredible story. The way she did it 
is she looked out in the universe and said, who would my business be a strategic acquisition for? In other words, it would be worth much more in their hands than mine. And she discovered there's a company called Care.com out there. Seven million subscribers to Care.com. Think of this business as you plug in your postal code and it pulls up, Care.com pulls up a list of care providers, au pairs and nannies and teachers in your local market, all star rated by the parents who've hired them. So it allows you to find an au pair in your local market. So Care.com has 7 million parents who are subscribers. Most of them need to have a nanny they need to pay. Breedlove had built this little $9 million company on the backs of 10,000 subscribers. So she made the case to Care.com, look, if if just 1% of your 7 million subscribers buy my payroll service, that's a business seven times my size. That's how she got, that's the narrative she wove to get them to spend $54 million on a $9 million business. And, and, yeah, an amazing story um, yeah. and a great one to end on, on, I think. It's just so important to, to, to identify who could be potential buyers for your business when you start looking at that. It is, but I want to end on this note. Stephanie did it for 25 years. It was a hard slog. It wasn't an overnight success. And she focused on the eight drivers along the way. Her net promoter score was 75% plus. She did one thing. So you had monopoly control. It was payroll for nannies. She didn't do payroll for anybody other than nannies. She had uh, great monopoly control. She had recurring revenue. She had it all. And so whether you want to sell now or in 25 years, thinking about these drivers gets you to that finish line, I think, in much better shape. Okay. John, John it's been a real pleasure talking to you tonight. It's always always an education when, when I hear you speak. Um, just tell us the name of your, your new book, which is coming out in January. It's called The Art of Selling Your Business. I shall be placing my pre-order immediately. <laughs> well, so, well, it was great to see you. Yeah, you too. We've got a, a workshop coming up in about four weeks' time, the Freedom Workshop. So if you want to learn more about Value Builder, please register and come along for that. The details will be uh, on the description. Um, we're going to put the questionnaire, the Value Builder Score questionnaire, uh, on the description for the podcast as well. And uh, if you want any more information at all, please contact Action Coach Bolton on bolton at actioncoach.com. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for your time and uh, look forward to speaking to you soon. Cheers. See you again. Take care.